She said that she had to call an ambulance. Um, she went into Omar's room and he wasn't responding to her and he had blood coming out of his mouth. She said this is something different and she's never seen something like this before. <coughs> They're in the emergency room right now. Here we go. Why, there's nothing we can do in the emergency room. I have no idea what to do. I seriously have no idea what to do. She said that, that, that Maybe he took too much medicine, trying to feel okay for tonight. Which is like a horrible thing. I have no idea what to do. I feel like we should go there. <sighs> yeah. I'm going to teach you how to play basketball correctly. As you can see, it's very simple to be a basketball star like myself, the greatest NBA player there was. This is Omar. He and I go back a while. Oh, is it hammer time? Hammer time. <laughs> We've all got a stack of people in our lives acquaintances, friends, but only a select few power through to become something more. And for me, ever since meeting in high school back in San Diego, Omar's been a pretty big deal. Omar, and I'm not just saying this because I'm related to him, Omar's probably one of the most kind-hearted, intelligent, easygoing guys that I know. And now Omar with the weather. Hi. Uh, it's really dark outside, so I can't tell what the weather is. Could be cloudy, could be even rainy. Like I care, I'm inside. Back to you, Jim. His ambition, his sense of humor, it, it's, it's contagious. Excuse me. Damn, she's gone. <laughs> hey, what's up, Planet X? I'm on my beach. Here down at Mission Bay Park, I am like stumbling over my words. What you'll always get with Omar is you're gonna get Omar in his total. Anything that he feels, any way he wants to look, he's just gonna be Omar. He doesn't fit any mold, he's fun, he's quirky, and always says the thing that you're not gonna hear from anybody else. Omar's gonna always come up with his Omarism. And now, for pointless humor. Hey Dick, my name's not Richard, <laughs> I know. Thank you! The friendship between Omar and Jakai was it's one of those unbreakable friendships, you know what I'm saying? The kind that people <laughs> wish they had. These guys were like twins. It was so, it was like so cute to watch. I remember um, you filming all the time, doing funny videos and funny clips. And then you started getting more serious and they, 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 every once in a while they'd have a theme or a premise. Inverse, the new sitcom about racial tension in the 90s. <laughs> we can make this work, man. Black, white, ebony, ivory. I was like, dang, these guys are just like so goofy and dorky together. And I knew, I knew back then, like these guys are gonna be friends forever. Like I knew that then. Omar definitely became the second big brother. Uh, remember when we were trying to like cool contests? Like, is this cool enough? Is that cool enough? No, 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 no. He's like my black child. He was, you know, the life of the party. And 
you know, just the, the silly jokes, things that happened throughout the years with, you know, some of the situations. You would look at him and you'd think you had nothing wrong with him. He's like a ghost. He would just be there and be gone and be there and be gone. And it was a wave. There'd be moments where he seemed completely fine. And then it just became more where there were moments when he was around and able to get around and if you go out and eat or whatever you were doing. But he wasn't really, you could tell he wasn't 100%. And I used to wonder why sometimes, like, we'll have something planned out. We're all supposed to get together and go somewhere. And all of a sudden, you get a phone call. And, oh, Omar's in the hospital. He's not going to be able to go. Birthdays are December. Yeah. Birthdays are December. Because that's my damn birthday. Are you serious? Yeah. How was your birthday this year, Omar? Huh? How was your birthday this year? Uh, <laughs> He would have these crying spells, and he would have swelling in his hands and his feet. We did not know. I mean, we were constantly taking him back and forth to the doctor, and no one seemed to know what was going on with him. They just didn't have any diagnoses. They thought that he was healthy. Um, one of the doctors told me that he had fat feet, and um, this particular day, my grandmother had bought Omar a pair of sneakers, and they were the cutest little sneakers, and um, when she got home, she had tried them on, and they fit just fine. Two, three days later, he was going through this crying spell and she tried to put the sneakers on and they wouldn't fit. She could not get his foot in the sneaker. And I remember her coming to me and saying, something is wrong with this boy. So we take him back to the doctor again. She, she, my mom loved telling this story. She said, the doctor, wanted him to see another doctor. So he gets on the phone, he says, I've got an overly concerned grandmother here. They ran some tests, and a few days later, I got the phone call that um, Omar had sickle cell anemia. Can you, I mean, can you define what sickle cell anemia is? Okay, sickle cell anemia. It gets its name from the shape of the blood cells. Normal human cells are fairly round, but sickle cells, uh, sickle cells are not, they're sickle shaped. Like you get sickle cell attacks in your joints and stuff because what happens is while yours would just flow through, they would just bounce off each other. Mine aren't that shaped, so they clap, they start. Now, because of their shape, sometimes they get uh, stagnant, and that's why patients, uh, sickle cell, they may get, they prone to blood clot. They don't have enough blood because these cells cannot carry enough hemoglobin and oxygen and nutrient. So the patients get a lot of pain in the bone. It's on a blood level, but it's very small, it's very painful. They have these episodes of pain crises where they'll be fine and then all of a sudden within 24 hours they'll have this excruciating pain. And the severity of the pain is similar to that of a bone fracture. 
I had a three-year-old girl come to our clinic two days after she clearly had broken her arm. And we asked the family, what, why didn't you come in sooner if this injury happened three days ago? And they said, she wasn't as fussy, she wasn't as upset as she was when she was having sickle cell pain. Now this pain is not limited to the bone. They can get the effect of this crisis anywhere because they're not having enough blood supply. They can infect any organ. With SS type sickle cell disease, the median survival for males is 42 years, for females it's 48 years. And the last years of their life are complicated by kidney failure, by chronic pain. So no matter what we do, we cannot fix the problem, but we can stave off some of the issues. So that's a, that's a huge challenge, just knowing no matter what we do, there are going to be problems. In the United States in particular, this is a very rare disease. And if we look at the state of California, for example, there's 35 million people in the state of California. We calculate there are about 9,000 patients with sickle cell disease in the state. So if you do the math, that means the likelihood of any particular physician encountering one of these patients is extremely low. The cornerstone for the treatment is pain medication, pain control, hydration and pain control. And it's very difficult because you have to strike a balance between not making them dependent. When a child, when somebody with sickle cell has pain, um, it's a combination of medicines. They almost certainly will require a narcotic Morphine, Dilaudid are the most commonly used ones. And frequently they require more narcotic and higher doses than people who maybe have had surgery or something like that. Because this pain that they have classically does not respond to morphine and those kinds of medications. And so the patients wind up taking tons of these things and it doesn't do anything at all to help them. Okay, so how about a quick overview here? Sickle cell hurts. A lot. Treatment often calls for high doses of pain medication that can have little impact given the nature of the pain. And whatever effect it does have lessens over a lifetime of building up tolerance. Even when pain isn't a factor, the nutrient-starved blood cells are constantly beating up every single internal organ. In fact, sickle cell is the most common cause of childhood stroke. Blood transfusions can briefly increase the number of normal red blood cells in the body, but iron levels have to be monitored closely. It's a rare disease, so many who are dealing with it have to also deal with doctors and nurses who don't have experience caring for what they're going through. Oh, and if all that wasn't enough... When they have an um, erection that will not go down for hours or days. But that's a medical emergency, you know, which uh, if it's not uh, taken care of, uh, it could, the patient could die. Priapism. Great. Sickle cell also has the power to give you a boner that can kill you. So why exactly is this disease a thing? If you look at the demographics where, where people with sickle cell live, it, they come out of communities or areas in the world that malaria was common. Places like India, South America, Africa, areas that typically have a larger proportion of people with browner complexions. But we'll come back to that. And malaria has to live in the red blood cell as it goes through its life cycle. And people who had sickle cell trait were able to survive malaria better than people who didn't have sickle cell trait. But unfortunately, um, when people with sickle cell trait have a child, there's a one in four chance that, that child will have sickle cell disease and have all the complications associated with that. The United States is estimated to have about 80,000 patients with sickle cell disease in the whole country. There are 240,000 patients born every year in Africa with sickle cell disease, and 80% die by their second birthday. Uh, this, this disease really sucks. To use medical terminology, I'm sorry if we're on, online here, but you can bleep that out. <laughs> Put in some other highfalutin word. <laughs> Say something to everyone out there in TV land. Hi. That's a pretty original thing to say. You're born with sickle cell, so Omar's been dealing with it from day one, which means it's always been a factor in our friendship. Still, that never stopped me from perpetually putting a camcorder in his face. Take this shirt off your head, boy. I'm trying to do an interview here. This is important. This is for channel JQ. 
Now, here we are, pushing 40, and I've moved my life to Atlanta, where Omar's been living with his family for over a decade now, so I can put a camera in his face. <laughs> Old habits die hard, I guess. This is a Omar Beach, and this is a take one. And that's take one without audio. So we'll go ahead and turn that on again. Here uh, we go again. Oh my goodness. So what do you think about the fact that we're doing this movie? Mm, I really don't think I'm important enough to merit some sort of document of me. I don't find myself that fascinating, I really don't. A lot of times, I don't explain to anyone about it. I don't have a lot of mottos, you know, but the ones that I do involve single cell and the one that, that, that explains that is, I never want my disease to precede me. I'm just Omar and I have a disease, you know what I'm saying? Can you, uh... What the hell is my other shoe because I like being two inches tall at once. <laughs> what's, what's this appointment for today? Uh, it's hydration and it's a preventative preventative trip where they give me medicine before, before I actually like get sick and need medicine. Like they're gonna give me pain medicine to sort of stay on top of the fact that you know, to, they're gonna lose just one shoe. It's in this room somewhere, I just don't know where. <laughs> What's the hydration room? There you go. People take it a lot heavier than I do. I'm guessing that's why Jakai's making this thing about me because people see it as weightier than I do. I mean, sure, like, at times I'd be, uh, you know, upset at what I had to deal with because I was a kid, you know. Like, I never acted like I had sickle cell unless I was actively dealing with a problem of sickle cell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Want to watch a movie or something? I got my little I'm kind of fat thingy. Okay. So now what happens? Now we sit here. There are two bags. I'll be getting two full bags. It's gonna be four hours apiece. So it's gonna be an eight hour day just sitting here. It's gonna be a long and boring day, man. Although there was no NFL, like, oh, we had some nice plays. And I realized, oh, I gotta see Steve Nash play. There's, like, four Hall of Famers in the game. I totally thought I was gonna make, like, a... Because then you have these R2-D2 kits that you can make. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they would roll around and stuff like that. I was gonna make one, but I just didn't have the money to buy it, the kit. Okay, so today we've got a, uh, a shoot 
with uh, Omar and just a few people that have sickle cell people that Omar have met um, while he's been getting uh, his hydration treatment. I'm in get ready mode, so it's a, it's a big day today. It has like this image in their head. Of, it, it's, which is different from other diseases you guys are talking about. Because like you said, it's like we're going to get better or we're not. Yeah. And this one, you have good days and bad days, which, right. is, which is, a you know, I can't and think well, of That's the whole thing. Like there's nothing clear cut. Especially when it comes to treatment about yeah. about yeah, I mean the only thing that's consensus between the, between us is that we all have sickle cell. Yeah, we yeah. all hurt. So all of us probably take like different nothing. medicine at home. All of us, you know, it's just different. You know, sickle cell disease and the treatment is so complex because you have to not only treat their disease, you have to also treat their social life. You know, social uh, uh, problem. Sickle cell disease has a unique feature as far as um, really the invisibility to some extent. So sometimes the pain that the person experiences is just they and their immediate family feel it and other people don't really see or understand everything that they're going through. You know, this is a child who, if he plays too hard or if it gets too cold or, um, you know, if it gets too hot, <laughs> so many different things affect him. You know, a lot of them, they can't be like their mates. You know, they're always ending up in the hospital. They can't go to do things. They can't go to school they can, because they're always in the hospital. My main thing is, as a man, I can't work a, a regular job, which I tried, and I have tried three or four times, have great jobs, but I was unable to keep it because if I'm in the hospital a week, in the hospital another two weeks. I've had adults tell me, I missed my graduation. I was sick at my wedding. Um, you know, I, it's hard for me to enjoy life because if I, if I get excited about anything, then that can, can cause pain. I mean, this is, might be totally off the subject and I don't know how it affects guys, but as a female, I am married. It comes time where uh, after sex, is it okay to say? Yeah. I'll go straight into a crisis. You know, I, I felt my husband had to push himself, you know, away from me just to save me that little bit from getting sick. So yeah, it can lead to a lot of helplessness uh, um, and then that can lead to depression. How much? Wow, my eye. <laughs> I just wish that he were able to share himself with so many other people um, because of the disease and because he's at this point in his life, I think he confines himself. On, on our way to pick up Omar, it's exciting because we've actually gotten in touch with him. It's, uh, to be honest, it's been a challenge the entire time we've been working on this thing. He's been very touch and go on, on when he's going to be willing to hang out, when he's not going to be willing to hang out. Or sometimes he just falls off the face of the planet. We'll have a plan, and then I won't hear from him all day. And then I won't hear from him all day the next day. There'd be like multiple days in a row where he'd just be in his room. I'd be worried about him too, like, oh man, I just want to hear him stirring. Just enough, like, oh, he's all right, you know? And it's like he's there, but you don't see him for multiple days in a row. He's kind of shut off, shut, he shuts himself out in that room. And then you start to feel frustrated because you feel like, oh, Omar's just not following through. He's just being this like, you know, non-responsive slacker or whatever, and then you find out that he's in a lot of pain, and then you feel like an asshole. You know, for him, I think that that's what makes it more difficult. It's more more of a mental battle for him. Because, you know, there is a pride factor in it. You want to do everything that everyone else is doing, but your brain, you know, has the accelerator just, you know, pushed to the floor, but your body's standing on the brake. It's so severe that he's, he's shut down and, and can't do anything. You know, talking about Omar, Omar has had this disease all his life, basically, and he's 
Um, he's had period where he was quite frequent to the hospital. And about maybe every two weeks, he ended up in hospital uh, with crisis. You know, we jokingly refer to him being in the hospital as a vacation, that, you know, it's just sort of a, a lighter way to look at, like, instead of saying, oh, so you were in the hospital again for a week, you know, like, oh, I was on vacation for a week. And it's just become so frequent and for such, you know, long extended periods of time that I, I can't even envision the, the emotional weight that that carries. How do you think how do you think your life would be different if you didn't have sickle cell? That's, what do you think you'd be doing? It's what this is. I, I, it's a dumb question, huh? What? It couldn't be much different. Um, it, it's just that I, maybe, I think I'd just maybe have a path. I'd just be on a path. But now it's just, I'm just here. He was coming out to California. To be honest, I was a little bit stressed out. We didn't know, is he going to be healthy? Is he going to not be in the hospital? Even if he's not in the hospital, is he going to be healthy enough to come to our wedding? There was such a huge gap between when I saw him at your wedding as opposed to when I had last seen him. But he just seemed like not depressed, but kind of depressed. And I don't want to be the guy to say that, but it just seemed like there was a downness to him. <laughs> That, 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 I think, was the highlight of his last few years, I think, to be honest with you. Honestly. When I saw him, I just, it, like, made me really, ups not upset, but just, like, shit. That's how I felt. Like, oh, shit. This disease is, like, really bad, or the real deal, you know what I mean? So it just, and then, and then I flash back to all the things that I feel like he could have done in his life that I don't think he's been able to. You'll be in, in the hospital. So. I think that he is a person who has accepted his life and he's dealing with it the only way that he knows how. I always, I was like, yeah, I might have pain, but I know how to deal with it. I know how to manage it. Even if I'm sick or whatever it is, I'm going for it. I tell my doctors, you're gonna patch me up. You're gonna send me out, give me my pills, and let me know what regimen I can take, but I'm gonna do this. Meet Constance. She's put a lot of effort into building a career in modeling. And all the while, living with sickle cell. But then, Things just started getting worse and worse and worse. And I just, it took away my life, my friends, dating, it, relationships with family members dwindled. There's a lot of shit I don't, you know, like, you know, oh, we have to worry, we have to do this deadline, we have to do this and this and that. Well, yeah, I can't act like that. And I've done that, you know, where I just like go for the goal. But if I can't achieve it, because something else is holding me back, then I realize I don't have to. And I don't have to give a shit about it. I said to him one time, don't you want to get married, have kids, you know? And his response to that was, who would want me? Epidemiologic studies generally do show that people with chronic pain do have symptoms of depression, anxiety, and despair or helplessness. And the prevalence is actually thought to be around 40% of people will experience uh, depression at some point. Now that can be mild, but it can be a severe form that would you know, really interfere with your ability to function at work and school and so on. So how does chronic pain affect the brain? 
there really isn't just one place that pain gets processed. So there are many parts sort of working together, including the prefrontal cortex, things like your thalamus, your hypothalamus, the hippocampus, the amygdala, that create this phenomenon of pain. What happens with the chronic pain in particular is that the body gets these signals that there's constantly a danger from the pain, so your body stays in that more hypervigilant state all the time, trying to protect itself from danger, again, even when there may not technically be one. In my own studies, I've actually found that anxiety is actually pretty huge as well. So again, it can range from mild anxiety, but it can be to the point of almost like a uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. To get unstuck from that chronic cycle of depressing, anxietizing, or angering, one of the ways we do that is by working on acceptance, by working on forgiveness of our bodies for not doing what we'd like them to be able to do, and instead saying, I have to work with what is. People can um, get really scared about medications, transfusions, but again, you have to do what you need to do to stay healthy. And it's the same thing with depression. When I look at Omar, I think that he often confuses that depression with his level of acceptance. And because he doesn't feel that he is depressed, then he'll just continue to feel that that's just the way he's dealing with it. I, I don't think he has given up on himself. I just think that maybe he doesn't realize his potential. He doesn't, he doesn't feel like going out walking a mile a day or maybe eating a little more healthier is going to help him. He's got like a lot of inertia behind him uh, to, to kind of where you stay still because of it. We try to um, catch them before they get into full crisis, and we can treat them here, pre-treat them here. The thing is, when he misses appointments, as with any patient, you know, and um, and I get on him like, come on, old man. And then when he misses appointments, so the next place I see him is he ends up in the hospital. Okay, to rate your pain on the scale, zero to ten. Zero is no pain, and 10 is the worst you've ever had. An eight. An eight. Okay. Tell me your name and your date of birth. And are you allergic to any medicines that you know of? All right, I'm just giving you Motrin. I know what this is. I'm used to it. But I'm sure it's not pleasant to watch. I've seen like, you know, people come visit me and I can see them and they look like they're pretty. Some of them look pretty upset or terrified of what I'm going through. It does something to you to see your adult son crying in pain. And there is nothing you can do because you can't rub it and make it feel better. Okay, so there's a typical catch-all hospital admission process that nearly all of us have experienced. You check in, wait in the emergency room, talk with the nurse, get your vitals taken, wait some more. Get sent to an exam room to then wait some more. The problem is waiting is often the very thing that allows a full-blown crisis to take hold and result in the need of a long-term hospital stay. Sickle cell just doesn't quite vibe with the established catch-all emergency room procedure. 
But in 1985, a sickle cell clinic opened at Grady Health Systems in downtown Atlanta, the first of its kind. They do things a little differently. So ideally, within an hour, we'll get them registered, we'll put them in bed, do vital signs on them, put IV on them, and start them on their pain management. Evidence has shown that when you keep them, when you get them right away, start medication and pain hydration right away, that within eight to nine hours, they get better. Most of them get better, and they go home. Because when patients go to the emergency room, they sit there for hours. Many providers and many healthcare professionals, they don't understand what it takes to be a sickle cell patient or what kind of pain they are suffering. If you go to the emergency room, they have the trauma. When patients have an accident, boom, they will see the patient. When the patient have cardiac issues, uh, stroke, chest pain, they will see the patient within 30 minutes. When the patient has asthma, quick. But sickle cell patients, they don't understand that they just make them see their So this, this center is actually developed for that purpose. When hydration treatment begins quickly, eight out of 10 sickle cell patients are able to avoid being admitted to the hospital altogether. Meanwhile, at the hospital closest to where he lives with his family, Omar waits and waits. Not exactly in tip-top shape. When you're in pain, it's like you, you need to put on TV, something interesting, something engaging, or you need to just talk. I didn't care what you talked about, even if you made me laugh, whatever it is. I just need you to help me to get out of me. I just need to escape. Oh my, he has an iPad, he has all the pads, you know, everything he has in his, in his bed. Because it's so boring to be in the four walls in the hospital. And the doctor came in, he says, you know, every person with sickle cell should have one of these because it distracts from some degree. It takes away from the pain. A lot of people can't separate pain from happiness. You know, pain is not a mood. Pain is a thing that you feel. Hey, what can you say? I'm sick, so I don't think that well. Oh. <laughs> You want to give me your car? My, your car? Yeah. My car? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Take advantage of that. Me, Justin, and James, we were all hanging out, and I went into crisis. So at that point, I do what I always do, go to the ER. But I was with my friends, and we were having a great time that day. And I was still having a great time with my friends, even though I was in a tremendous amount of pain. But a lot of people back there, they were kind of suspicious of it. I mean, I know my mom, she always tells me, you know, like, oh, you know, stop laughing and stuff like that. She'll say that occasionally because, for one, you know, because sickle cell people, we take a lot of medicine throughout our lives, we're kind of stigmatized as addicts. In the minds of uh, people in the U.S., sickle cell disease is linked with the African-American race. So African-American race has its own challenges. You know, people get shot for being African-American. People get profiled. Um, so you can imagine that a person, an African-American young man or young woman coming into the emergency room, that the thought is they're looking for drugs. There's a lot of social misunderstanding you can imagine being a black guy my size, walking into an emergency room and saying, I have severe pain in my leg and I need Demerol or morphine. They're gonna look at you and the first thing they think is that you're a drug abuser. It's not until like I reached like my mid twenties that I started seeing the other side of it. Yeah, that's that's, that's kind of like how I feel like, now that I think about it, Pete, you know, during when I was younger it was kind of smooth, but as I started getting a teenager and 20s, 20s to 30s, started to care starts to change. Stigma really comes in, sadly, when people uh, aren't cute kids anymore. I don't know how else to say it. Oh, well, there's a pretty good chance that opiate-based drugs were in Omar's system when these adorably huggable photos were taken. The very drugs that were prescribed to him by various pediatricians since he was diagnosed at four months old. 
Yeah, a lifetime of managing your medication might teach you a few things about managing your medication. We're going? Yeah. Okay, so we'll start off here with Warfarin. That is a, the blood thinner. Benadryl helps with itching because all narcotics make me itchy. So I take that in service of these, the big dogs, Percocet, uh, 10, 325, so, which is the higher level, the standard, I think starts at five. Methadone is sort of my latest secondary medicine. You know, like you usually have a main medicine and what we call a breakthrough, something that will pump up the party a little bit more if your first medicine isn't helping enough. We've been through a lot of pills and it's just the one we're testing because I've had Vicodin. I've had like the Vicodin ES. I don't like, I don't want to take Oxycontin. I think that's too strong. I used to take a drug called hydroxyurea and most of the patients have tried it. And so some people it works great for them and that's awesome. It just doesn't work for me. But other than that, yeah, that's my roster. Unless we go into hospital drugs and that's just the intravenous forms of these medicines that have, that have a stronger power. You know, that's why you go to the hospital for pain management because they have better medicines than your pills. Patients with sickle cell they will go to an emergency department and they will say, I need four milligrams of morphine or I need two milligrams of Dilaudid. And any time somebody comes into an emergency room and tells you exactly what dose of what drug they need, that sets up a red flag. So again, they've been in pain for three days and they have to fix their hair and put on makeup to go to the emergency room and not in their sweats so that they look like a professional. And, and because they know that the, some providers see a drug seeker and not um, a person who has a master's degree who, again, happens to be very sick. That stuff actually messes up for a real sick patient like ourselves. So when we come into the hospital, they're thinking that we just want to get high, which is totally not true. Because if I wanted to get high, I can, you know, do other right. things. So, right. you know, that's, more fun and that, that's right. what I'm just baffled like, well, if I wanted to be, I wouldn't want to be here, you know, getting high, because this is not fun. But Fewer people with sickle cell disease evidence true addiction compared with nurses and doctors. <laughs> nurses and doctors have about the highest prevalence of drug addiction. Studies have been done. There is no higher rate of addiction or substance abuse in the sickle cell population compared to the general population. People have articulated to me, you know, why would I go to the emergency room, get an IV, be insulted by you anyway, be asked a hundred questions, uh, be accused of being, why would I keep coming? And they said, I keep coming because I have pain. And sometimes going to the ER, depending on the hospital, you can have people who will really help you or you can have people who judge you. You have people who will know you and like, oh, I know her. I'm familiar with everything that goes with her. Oh yeah, let's get her back right away, do what we can. Or you'll have the other people who are like, oh, okay, well this girl over here who might have broke her foot, oh yeah, I'm gonna let her go first. Cause you know, hey, I can see her pain, but I can't see yours. I mean, I could go on for a long time about experiences that I've had speaking to providers and stuff where just a little bit of information to them has totally changed their whole attitude because they just weren't aware. When I was teaching uh, master's level students and bachelor's students, the textbooks we had, it was barely a nod and it definitely was not considered serious. And so to kind of progress and find this is, this is life threatening, this, this can end your life and it changes your life and it has all these forms. I was amazed at what I didn't know. I mean, you have to look at other people with diseases that's similar to ours where they have pain. Patients with cancer, leukemia. You know, these type of patients receive the same type of um, pain medicine that, you know, we receive even at home, oral, and then, or when we go I into the hospital. Before. They take way more medicine than we would ever yeah. want. I don't knock cancer. My mom passed away with cancer. The treatment that she received and the treatment that I received is Worlds totally apart. different. In a year span, yeah. how many cancer fundraisers do they have? Yes, yeah, right. exactly. How, many, na how much national attention does cancer get? Sickle cell disease really represents uh, an enormous health disparity in this country.
And um, ever since it was identified over 100 years ago in this country, it's not been well uh, as well researched from a clinical standpoint as it could be from a quality of life standpoint. Uh, the research that has been done hasn't benefited patients with sickle cell disease in terms of quality of life. We have to look at the real experience of individuals and groups and what it really means to be young and African-American and with a real invisible disease. Um, and how that's perceived. And we have to work on the real health care and the perceptions and the education and do the advocacy that we need to do to be responsible psychologists and physicians and social workers. So this is the medical system that Lauren, Walter, Christina, Kevin, and Omar know. The system they all grew up in. The system that they've all relied on like they're supposed to. It has to be a partnership with your physician but too many of us think it's our physician responsibility to take care of us, and it's not their responsibility. Well, this is Parnell. He knows that system too, and like Omar, has sickle cell SS, which is the more severe brand of the disease. He volunteers his time to lead a support group for the Sickle Cell Foundation of Georgia, but he manages his care in a way that's not typical, at least not around here. Fortunately, um, I was born in Haiti, um, and as a young child in Haiti, even diagnosed with sickle cell disease, I never knew of a hospital. And it's not the fact that we didn't have hospitals, it's the fact that my grandparents did the natural stuff with us. And, and, and I think that education is what's needed in the sickle cell community, because there's a, a lot of information on narcotics and pharmaceuticals, but there's not enough information on the natural process. I would still use um, the medical community, uh, and I definitely encourage people to do that. Um, but at the same time, I take control of my health on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And that starts with what I have control of, which, which is my thought process on how I react to events in my life, uh, what I eat on a daily basis, what I drink. Um, to me, that's set me not only apart, but ahead of the game, faster than just being dependent on somebody else to tell me, this is how you're going to take care of yourself. So what would Parnell's advice look like? First, rest. Be very intentional about rest. Unplug. Embrace quiet. Focus on building a positive mind state over constantly seeking distraction. Second, hydrate. Always put a full glass of water at your bedside so the first thing you do when you wake up is drink a glass of water. Not soda, not juice in a supermarket that's often pasteurized, loaded with sugar, or from concentrate. We're talking water. Or we're talking natural juice that's made fresh from real fruits and real vegetables. Third, nutrition. Be very disciplined about what you eat. Call it the 95-5 rule. Basically, eat only healthy natural food 95% of the time. The other 5% is reserved for splurging when you absolutely feel like you need to splurge. For most of us, Total commitment to these three guidelines would be an unbelievable challenge. But it's tough to dismiss what it's done for Parnell. This man is 46 years old. That's four years older than the median life expectancy. And he hasn't needed a hospital stay in over five years. You know, we either are gonna make a choice to implement rest or your body will force you to rest. And sometimes it'll do it drastically and say, here's a heart attack. And Right. That's going to slow you down for a while. Right. <laughs> you know, so we, we have to learn to listen to the body. Right. You know, and we can't keep moving away from nature because we are part of nature. Mm hmm So. One, two, three. Rolling. Planet X on Channel 4 is proud to announce its new Planet X Extreme Suntan Lotion. It can take you from this horrendous whiteness to this beautiful golden lusciousness. It'll work for you too. Find out how to order your very own by watching Planet X on Channel 4. What is, what are you going to the doctor for today? Uh, today I'm going in just like as a, as a routine checkup. And then they'll probably write me prescriptions for drugs, and then I'll leave. Because that's how a doctor's office works. Okay, so. 
today uh, I just came out of Dr. Anya Bula's office for like a routine checkup, get my refills and everything. I got my vitals checked and then I got my fingers stuck. What else did we talk about? Oh, we talked about, we talked about having a, doing a bone marrow transplant. It's a tricky subject for me because I really am like it. Can you can you outline what's on the table there? They would they would transfer bone marrow into me, and then that would create proper blood cells as opposed to the sickle shaped blood cells. And basically, at its best. It would eliminate the disease. What that would mean for him is a complete cure of his sickle cell disease. Complete. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. A cure? This is amazing news, isn't it? I'm scared and hesitant because there's a 15% chance of death when I know that I can handle having sickle cell. You know, I've done this my entire life. Honestly, I, I bucked at it. My family is the one that pushed me into it because I was like, no, I'm not going to do it because you know what? I might have pain, but I know how to manage my disease. I'm healthy. I've been this way all my life. I have sickle cell. Sickle cell doesn't have me. That was the logic, and, and it, it was my identity. It was who I was. And then when it was like, oh, OK, well, you know, you could possibly get cured. Well, then I was like, well, who, who will I be if I don't have sickle cell? Sounds like a weird excuse, because, you know, you think, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you go for the big cure? But I'm scared, I guess that's what it is, I'm just scared. When, and on the other hand, I know that I can do this. I'm pretty sure I could do this for the rest of my life. I won't say that that kind of pain becomes your friend, but it certainly becomes your companion. So it, it can be hard to, depending on what your, the trajectory of your life has been, you may have a whole identity around pain. And then when we started entertaining the notion of, you know, okay, there is a cure out there. It's called bone marrow transplant. And Emory University is actually doing it. They're conducting the studies. And I am the first person ever cured of sickle cell under the STRIDE HCT study. I'm the 10th adult ever in the world to be cured of sickle cell. You've been working on this dilemma all by yourself? My mom knows about it. And she knows I'm thinking about it. She thinks there's no question about it. She thinks it should just be done. He's scared. I th and he has a right to be. He has a right to be. Because that could take him out quicker than the disease process itself, so. Yes, I would do it again. Even though it was hell, even though I, I know what I went through, but given where I came from, it was never going to get better. It was only going to get worse. So you're completely pain free. You don't, like all the complications that you used to have, like do you have to still worry about being cold or warm the same way? It's just gone. It's just, it's just, I just can't even fathom. I know, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine it either, but no pain. Constance has a story that's spectacular, but rare. And living just down the hall, she happened to have a 10 out of 10 bone marrow match in her little sister, Samantha. Yet her road to the cure was far from easy. She went through intensive chemotherapy, extensive radiation, all to destroy her diseased cells so they could be replaced by normal ones. Basically, taken within an inch of her life to bring her back healthy. For Omar, with no 100% match in his family to speak of, his situation is much dicier. There's even more risk of serious complications, including infection, graft versus host disease, not to mention a double digit chance of death. And even if a transplant was successful, it would only cure his sickle cell. The years of organ damage caused by the disease would stay behind. 
I, I, I personally, I don't know that his body could, could, could take a bone marrow transplant at this point in time. Unrelated bone marrow transplants for sickle cell disease are fraught with complications. Um, when you think about bone marrow transplant, you're actually trading one disease for another. You're trading sickle cell disease for being a person with a bone marrow transplant. It's yours. You want to wait for him? Yes, please. Okay. This is a weird dance. <laughs> Constance was 25 when she made the move in 2012, nearly 15 years younger than Omar is now. And that was only after her family worked relentlessly to convince her to do it. As for Omar, only he can decide. And in the meanwhile, he can just keep living the only life that he knows. No, you take care of yourself. Thank you very much. All right, see you later. Have a good evening. According to the CDC, one in 5,000 Americans suffers from sickle cell anemia. That's a blood disorder that prevents oxygen from getting to the limbs and the organs. We met one Atlanta man who's lived with sickle cell since birth, and now he's telling the story of his private nightmare in a very public way. Uh, Ja'Kai Mickelson and Omar Beach go camera. way back. That's Omar, my best friend, still today, some 20 odd years later. They're making a movie together. He's probably the silliest guy I know. It sounds like fun, <laughs> but it's actually serious. Omar's dealing with something that for many is unfamiliar. Deadly serious. You see, Omar has sickle cell anemia. Looks very interesting. How are they gonna pay for the film? It's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. you know, um, Jakai has paid all of it out of his own pocket. They are looking for help right now. They've just started a fundraising campaign at Indiegogo.com. They're hoping to raise enough money to cover post-production, but certainly a powerful film about a very private issue, but, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully getting the message out there. Wow, that's great. Thanks a lot. Today, we are at the Capitol building, holding a candlelight visual for sickle cell because it is September, National Sickle Cell Awareness Month. My good friend Lauren is talking. We're here to make some noise and get some awareness. What can we do so people really understand this disease? We are here in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we are doing this. <laughs> We drove here from Atlanta, it's just after midnight, and we are uh, going to a sickle cell event tomorrow. Um, it's almost like a, this is a ridiculous thing to call it, it's like a Comic-Con sickle cell. There's gonna be a lot of discussions and stuff and we're here to capture it and film it. Iron Man will be there, but he'll just be IVs everywhere, just, he can just lay it. <laughs> Here we are, sickle cell disease, let's talk about it. Because we do not hear enough about this condition. We do not talk about this condition. And I want us to have an open and honest dialogue about how your children are feeling, how you are feeling. I want you to think about the mental piece of it, right? What do you think, not what do you know, but what do you think about sickle cell. So on our registry, we've got in the United States about 12 million, close to 12 million people. Yeah, Only 7% of those 12 million people are an African American here. So we need more African Americans on the registry. We actually need all minorities. It's out of bounds right now. When a person of African American descent is coming to our registry to find, to find a match, their chances are in the 60 range. Whereas for Caucasians, it's in the 90 range. So we need more people to get on our bench.
And I'm sure you see people with the cameras um, around. My good friend Omar Beach and Jakai, they're doing a documentary. They're trying to make a difference and put the awareness out there. Okay, well, I can't remember. She said they were Piedmont Henry. Is that what yeah, she said? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's where we gotta go. I just, uh, I don't know what we're gonna do. I don't know how we're gonna help. Well, I feel like we should be there and yeah. just, hopefully by that time, they'll at least know what's going on. We just realized, okay, we probably need to get to the hospital because we don't know what's happening. The fact that she's saying she's never seen anything like this before scares the living shit out of me. I'm afraid he's had a... Like organ failure or something? Not an organ failure, but like a, a stroke. I'm afraid he's had a stroke. They, they heard a fall and they went up there to see what happened and, and that's how they found him and and she kept saying to me and this is this is this is the thing that she kept saying to me that I've never seen this I've never seen this and when we got there, I personally was not prepared for what we encountered or what we experienced. Um, Omar was not in good shape. He was not present or lucid or, or coherent, but he was not unconscious. He was he was moving around. It, he, his his eyes were open, and he and he was he was moving. It was like a turtle on his back. He was trying to get out of his bed, but his eyes were empty. He he looked right past us. He was in a state that's just very disturbing to ever see someone that you love in. Omar was a zombie. He was alive, and and he had some sort of weird instinct thing was still making him move, but he wasn't home. It was sort of one of these surreal experiences, and it, we could see right away how dire the situation was. They didn't have the equipment there at Piedmont Henry to give him the tests that he needed to figure out exactly what happened. It's really hard to feel like you're in a hospital and there's nobody there that really understands what's going on or can help or can give you information on why he's in this state. Is he okay? Will he come out of it? Is it a stroke? 
is there brain damage and that's why this is happening? So at that point, they're looking around the city for an empty bed or, or for a hospital that'll take him. We were gonna have an ambulance coming, um, but we, we were waiting for the ambulance about four and a half hours. Everybody's so used to Omar being in the hospital. It's just this kind of normal thing, but this was completely different. His pastor happened to show up. She, she came up from Omar's mom's church. We all joined hands and we prayed. We prayed for Omar over his bed. And, and Omar's still twitching this entire time. And if, if there was gonna be something that was gonna make it real, I mean, that was it. And it was just really scary to think that that might be the last way that we see Omar. That first day, I literally told Omar it was okay. I told him it was okay to go. I, he, he's fought for so long, you know. Finally, they found a bed. He, I mean, he went from this, this shoddy closet to this like future Bruce Banner sort of room where they got all this crazy equipment and he's, he's got the tubes hooked up. It's so weird. I was just so thankful to see him resting. But okay, so yesterday, you know, we canceled the fundraiser because we're not gonna have it without you there. Um, there was clearly a different level of care. There was a different level of knowledge about what he was going through and what he needed in order to come out of it. And then, you know, he, he was like that for the next two days. There was a point where they started to take control of the infection and he was starting to respond to like, you know, his mom touching his hand or his mom saying Omar. He was kind of giving little nods that he was getting what was going on. And then from there, slowly but surely, things started improving. He's feeling better and, and he's back. And then he got taken out of uh, intensive care and he got put into kind of a regular room. I'm starting to tell jokes again, starting to be sarcastic. <laughs> Omar didn't realize how big of a deal this was. He's walked up in the hospital so many times, he didn't realize how huge this was, how close he came. I mean, his entire family was there. And I think once he kind of woke up and started getting his thoughts back, he was like, oh, this one, this one must have been something special. It was almost as if the nurses, the doctor, just really wasn't expecting him to pull through this. Um, he was in kidney failure. He was in um, liver failure. And I remember the nurse telling me that you just need to prepare yourself. And as a mother, I just wasn't ready to let that go. And I just couldn't wrap my head around the fact that they were telling me that he wasn't going to make it. I don't know. I'm telling you, like, honestly, of all the people who were involved with that time, I'm probably the worst person to ask because I was not there for most of it. I was just with my sleeping body, I guess. The whole thing 
was like seven days. Went from the sixth, which was a Saturday, up to the next week, and then he was home. Go either way. Hands up, don't shoot. I'd already started thinking about what my world was going to be like without Omar. And to have him come back into it was part of me that was almost like angry that he was back to like take me through all that and, and not have the closure. I, 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 this as I say it, obviously logically it makes no flipping sense. But I've lost people close to me before, but I've never <laughs> lost somebody that came back. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, gosh, two weeks later, we were on our way to New York. Yeah, so life is crazy. New York, New York. Tamoya and Lejorn, the people who were putting on the fundraiser, it was just unbelievably generous of them to offer the proceeds to the movie. On one hand, it was incredible, but that was, I don't even know, probably three weeks, definitely no more than four weeks after Omar was literally on the brink of death, that suddenly he was getting on a plane with us and going to New York. At the same time, it's this very real and in your face thing of what Omar deals with every day. Um, once again, uh, thank you guys for all coming out to support the September Social. Sickle cell anemia is a disease that not only plagues Omar, but there's a lot of people in the world. Um, there's one in 500 African American babies that are actually born with the traits every day. Um, one in 12 people carry the traits. So look around you. There's clearly more than 12 people here. So there's. I, I mean, my my goal is just always to get Omar out there as much as possible. And for a while, like Omar didn't want to hang out with other people that have sickle cell because. He, he said he found those people depressing. You're talking about people that can relate to what you're going to, and I, and I think that's important for everybody, to find people that can share your perspective, because that helps you gain perspective. This film has probably made us know more about each other than we knew, and I, I know, I think Omar has, has kind of embraced the disease in a different way than he ever has. The biggest surprise outside of the stigma for me has been when I first heard about the fact that Omar might be a candidate for the bone marrow transplant, in my mind's eye, my first reaction was like, boom, done deal, go for it. That's what he's gonna do, and he's got a chance to be cured, and it's gonna be great, and it's worth the risk. And, and I was a bit surprised at first that Omar was hesitant for that, but now I, I feel like I totally get it. You know, and to be fair, he's made some big strides. He's got a driver's license now, and he, the other day I saw him, he was actually driving around like running his own errands. Oh God, I, I, that's been a long time. This year has been overall quite an unfortunate adventure. Basically, I've been hospitalized a lot. Uh, the blood clots in my legs are kind of just acting ridiculous and bloating and blowing up and pussing out and all this stuff. and. It really hurt in real sense. Oh my God, yeah, motherfucker. You punched me in my face. I'm so sorry. 
That was ridiculous. I was just trying to move my leg. <laughs> that is... Please punch me in my face. Dude. Dude. Stop, stop. It's back up. <clears throat> just, just return to zero. Just calm down. <laughs> stop. Sorry. So, from one end to the other, the last year has just been pretty devastating in terms of long-term effect and severity. But I've always maintained optimism. With the help of the proceeds raised by the September Social in New York and the generosity of many others, we hit our fundraising goal making the things you're watching right now an actual thing to be watching right now. But we had to make good on a certain event that was supposed to happen here in Atlanta back on September 6th, one that we'd sold quite a few tickets for. And still one more consideration. What's your date of birth? 12-24-1974. Not surprisingly, Omar's birthday was often lost in the shuffle. So much so that he's never actually had a birthday party. So, while it might be a month late, we've decided to Trojan horse a surprise birthday party into this thing. After all, 40's a big year. Los Angeles. Um, I haven't seen Omar since maybe 2002. I flew in because, uh, actually because before this past summer, I haven't seen my cousin in a while. It's gonna be real nice. Well, I wanna see him see everyone else. And when, I, when this idea was first being mentioned and like brewing, like, oh man, it'd be great. It's also one of those things you don't think is gonna happen. And then here it is happening. Everybody's here. I came in from San Diego, well, because he's kind of like my surrogate kid. Him and Jakai were tight from junior high up, and they still are. It's pretty incredible. I I lived with Omar for just just a year, but he's really silly and really funny. Yeah, I remember one time he told me um, he was a uh, an ice cream man disguised as a serial killer. <laughs> we had this opportunity to help host this fundraiser for this great celebration, only to find out it's also his first birthday party. I think it's a good testament to Omar, just as many of us that were able to drop everything and head out for this. I don't want to miss it, I want to be here for, you know, See how it all goes down. I think that's why we're all here. I mean, this is Omar at work because he's kind of brought all of these people that are involved in this thing. James doing the music, Justin gonna do the poster. These are all people that Omar has a really good personal relationship with, and it's it's kind of fun to come together and try to do something. So I really hope he has a good night because he, you know, he deserves it. There we go. I met Omar when we were in high school. He was a big brother for me, and, and 
he, he's been the guy that's given me tons of advice, and he's played a huge role in me becoming who I am. But I'd always spend time kind of wishing, like, gosh, what could Omar be if he didn't have this disease? Like, what has this disease gotten in the way of for him? But sometimes it's like, you know, he still had an amazing impact on my life, and you've got to be thankful for that, so there's no reason to cry over the spilled milk. And I think, you know, I'd rather have Omar in my life as is than not at all. And, like, even with all of it, you know, a lot of people think it's a miserable life, but it's not. I feel very fortunate. But the way I do it is to stay optimistic and don't dwell on it. Just let's get to tomorrow, and it will start over again. So why cry? I mean, there's a lot of is there, but there's that. Oh, and yes, point, I agree. Point counterpoint. I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. It's like a presidential debate with ass noise, <laughs> which is what a presidential debate is, pretty much.